اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم یا اہل الكتاب لا تغلو فی دینکم ولا تقولوا على الله إلا الحق إنما المسيح عيسى بن مريم رسول الله وكلمته وكلمته والقاها إلى مريم وروح منه فآمنوا بالله ورسله ولا تقولوا سلاثة انتهوا قيرا لكم إنما الله إله واحد سبحانه أن يكون له ولد له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وكفى بالله وكيلا In this ayat 171 of section 23 of Surah An-Nisa, the fourth Surah. Allah says, O people of the book, commit no excesses in your religion, nor say of Allah aught but truth. Jesus Christ, the son of Mary, was no more than an apostle of Allah, and his word which Allah bestowed on Mary and a spirit proceeding from him. So believe in Allah and his apostles. Say not Trinity, desist. It will be better for you. For Allah is one Allah. Glory be to him for exalted is he above having a son. To him belong all things in the heavens and on earth. And Allah is enough as a disposer of affairs. The Quranic revelation appeared six centuries after Jesus. And unlike Judaism and Christianity, which do not admit any revelation subsequent to their own, directs all Muslims to believe in the scriptures that preceded it in the same surah section 20 ayat 136 it stresses the important positions of Allah's emissaries such as Noah Abraham Moses the prophets and Jesus in the same surah in section 23 of ayat 163 then in this ayat it mentions the attributes of Jesus Christ, a son of a woman Mary, and therefore a man, giving the same description of parthenogenesis to his biological birth without a biological father as the Gospels, an apostle and a spirit from God, but not Nausbillah, God. For says Quran, God is independent of all needs and has no need of a son to manage his affairs. 
the word which is which occurs in this surah which is bestowed on mary means that he was created from god's word be kun and not as in the gospel of john or whoever wrote it surrounded by alexandrian and gnostic mysticisms the word logos in greek which is surrounded by this mysticism the quran follows on from the two revelations that preceded it but is free from contradictions and various human manipulations and provides a unique quality when examined objectively and in the light of science that is it is in complete agreement with modern scientific data madam president mr ahmed didat and ladies and gentlemen it is indeed an honor for me to welcome mr ahmed didat this evening on behalf of the daughters of islam the question arises who are the daughters of islam very briefly we have two basic aims firstly to forge unity among muslims hence our motto ittihad bainul muslimat and secondly our real mission is to acquire knowledge and to help in spreading it in every way possible it is in connection th with this that we have been holding group discussions and organizing lectures by various scholars so ladies and gentlemen in keeping with our mission of acquiring knowledge we have with us today mr ahmed didat the renowned scholar of comparative religion from south africa his debates with christian scholars are now famous and are viewed all over the world he uh, operates from durban where he, he has set up the islamic propagation center and uh, he has been awarded with the king faisal award in recognition of his services to islam so uh, now i request mr brother ahmed dida to please address the public اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا اهل الكتاب تعالوا الى كلمه سواء بيننا وبينكم ان لا نعبد الا الله ولا نشرك به شيئا ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا اربابا من دون الله فان تولوا فقل اشهدوا باننا مسلمون صدق الله صدق الله العظيم my dear daughters and my brothers and sons on the top it gives me great pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon to come and share with you my thoughts on some aspects of islam and i was in a quandary i was in a haze I didn't know I was thinking what shall I say what shall I say what am I going to speak and uh, as if god sent the sister who preceded me here she read the verse that I read to you just now from the holy quran and that gave me an idea that look this is the voice of god as if allah bari ta is speaking through her so look speak about this and i was greatly relieved You see, it has happened that when the qari, you know, generally when our functions start, we get a qari, a good reciter, to start the our our meetings, and uh, then they call the speaker. It was for Juma prayer in my own city in Durban. The qari was called pre khutbah talk. The qari was called. He recited. and then they called me says now mr dida to speak so out of what the qari was reading from the quran i repeated a verse from his recitation he was reading about on who will let the arsal rasulahu bil huda wa din al haq ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا that portion of the ruku he was reading 
So I read that verse out of that full recitation. And I'm asking my audience, the sons of Islam, I said, in the past 24 hours, if any of you have heard that verse, please put up your hands. I said, in the past 24 hours, it was actually in the past four minutes, the, everybody had heard. But I'm asking, I want to make it a little harder for them. I said, look, in the past 24 hours, anybody heard these words? I repeat again. And I repeated the verse again. Vamar Sanlaka. And so on. And says, please put up your hands. And one hand went up. One hand went up. In a congregation, Juma congregation, only one hand went up. And I recognized the owner of that hand. That that person knew Arabic. Because he knew Arabic, he knew what the Qari was reading. Therefore he caught and he retained, he remembered what was read in the past 24 hours. The rest of them, Muslims, all born Muslims. Young and old. 99.9% they had never heard the word in the past 24 hours what does that mean it meant that this was just as pure sound music recitation we are listening we say mashallah how beautifully the Qari reads we admire his recitation and we say subhanallah subhanallah we praise the tone, we praise the breath control. How he, the Qari, in, for two minutes, the Qari Abdul Samad Abdul Basit, when he starts reciting, two minutes, his breath doesn't break. Carries on and on and on. If you or I were trying to compete with him, our breath would break down half a dozen times before he's finished one breath. So people exclaim, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, everybody shouts. What makes, what it makes one to wonder, what is the Allah who Akbar about? Allah is great, about what? The breath control. The breath control, it's not the meaning, what is the man telling you? As a people, as a whole, the Muslim world, the Allah's kalam is like water on duck's back. You know, you put water on duck's back, even in the rainy season, the duck is dry. You know, it has its feathers, the water just flows off. Similarly, Allah's kalam also flows off from our backs, from our friends, from our minds. It's just the sound, the music, the rhythm. We read the Quran for sawab, 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 blessings, blessings. And wallah, I believe that we will get the sawab. But the real message that is being delivered is being lost. Therefore, we don't catch it because we don't understand the language. We don't understand what is being read. Fortunately, this afternoon, our sister also translated it. She also mentioned that it is from Surah Nisa. She also mentioned that she started from verse 171. So, it is an occasion for us that we can go home and check it up. Check up these things. Not that we distrust the speaker or my sister who was here a little while back. We are not distrusting her. But if we go home and if we can check it up, going over it once more again, she has said something, maybe we caught something, some message of it, and some of it we didn't, because we might not have been familiar with it. But if we go home and check it up in our own good time, then that knowledge become, becomes a part of us. It becomes a part of our knowledge. And then when we start sharing with others, it really becomes our property. Like this, ah, it's very good, you listen to a talk, mashallah, you know, it was well delivered, you know, well, the man was well spoken, and he was mesmerizing the people, all that kind of things can happen, but it's, it's a short-term entertainment. We're getting entertained. You do get entertained. We all get entertained. You see, by our learned people, they come along and entertain us. So, it is a very good idea to go home and check up in the Qur'ans at home. I take it that every Muslim has a Qur'an at home. But it's very difficult. 
for the non-Arab, we non-Arabs. I don't know how many Arabs are here. They might be very conversant with the Quran, I don't know. But the bulk of our people, very, very difficult. Our sister said Surah Nisa, Surah Nisa. In a Quran, a volume of this magnitude, this particular one is a translation, 1920 pages. Where will you find Surah Nisa? In the first instance, go and check it up. Where? But if you have a translation like this one, this particular one, published on this subcontinent, this part of the world, in Lahore, it was first published in 1935, or there around, by Sheikh Muhammad Ashraf, Kashmiri Bazar, Lahore. This translation is by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. There is another one, Muhammad Ali Kadiani. This is Yusuf Ali. Abdullah Yusuf Ali. Now, in this particular translation, it has advantages which no other translation has. And the advantage here is, Number one, that this is the only translation I've seen so far which gives you a verse-by-verse -verse translation. For example, starting with Surah Fatiha, the opening chapter of seven verses, it begins, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Exactly opposite that Bismillah in Arabic, on the opposite side, you see, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen So all praise is due to Allah The cherisher and sustainer of the worlds Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Most gracious, most merciful Maliki Yawmiddin The master of the day of judgment Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'een He says, Thee alone we worship And thee alone we ask for help Ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem Say, guide us on to the straight path Sirat al-lazeen an'amta alayhim The path of those on whom thou hast bestowed thy favors Ghayr al-maqdubi alayhim wal al Not of those who earn thine anger Nor of those who go astray Verse by verse translation And as you are reading you can focus your attention more on this translation because as soon as you read Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, at the end of that ayah, that meaning, you see a number. That number tells you that there is a commentary, tafsir at the bottom. This particular one will say 19. You look at number 19 at the bottom in smaller types, gives you the tafsir, commentary. It tells you what is Rahman, it tells you what is Rahim, what is the difference between these two, and what are the relationship between the two. So the, your attention is focused on the ayah longer period of time. So you digest that knowledge. It's more easily digestible. Because the Quran, the whole Quran, is a book of revelation, wahi, but Allah bari ta'ala sent this wahi like telegrams. Actually, that's how they came to him, by telegrams. It was not like stories like, you say, you know, once upon a time, the fox and the grapes, or the wolf and the lamb, or once upon a time, there was a, a tailor in China, and he had a son called Aladdin, and no, no, Alibaba, and the forty thieves. No, nothing like that. The Quran is a very concentrated book. And Allah talks by telegrams. And everybody, it's not very easy for everybody to understand telegrams. We might be literate, we read books and all that, read newspapers, but telegram, to grasp the message of the telegram is harder. And Allah is talking by telegrams. You see, like for example, like for example, our Nabi Karim sallallahu was engrossed in a discussion, in a dialogue with the Christians of Najran. It was in Medina. The Christians of Najran, outside Medina, they heard, they were Arab Christians, they heard that there is another Arab now in Medina, and he is claiming to be in communion with the Almighty. He is claiming to be a prophet. So they said, let's go and cross-examine him. Let's find out what he knows. So they came to Medina, and they, they were housed in the Masjid of the Prophet, Masjid al Nabawi, very simple structure plastered mud on the floor, mud walls, palm leaf, fiber on the roof, very simple structure. 
there were no hotels and no motels in those days. So they were housed in the masjid, they slept in the masjid, they ate in the masjid, and they had the dialogue in the masjid. And when Sunday came, our Nabi Karim وسلم, offered the masjid, they said, look, you can offer your prayers here, and he was that tolerant. But during the course of the discussion that was going on, the spokesman for the Christian poses the question, say, all right, now tell us now, among so many other things. Oh Muhammad, now tell us, what is your concept of God? So our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa he doesn't start like you and I. When we haven't got a ready answer, we say, well, you see, it's like, you'll, you'll try me out during question time, and you'll see it. You see, well, you know, we are, I'm going to, everybody, everybody is fumbling for words, for thoughts, trying to gather my thoughts, and I go around the bush a little bit. Everybody goes around the bush, you know, others going around and around, beating around the bush, till he says, yes, this is the answer. Our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa he doesn't do that. He is waiting for the Almighty. He wants to know, say, look, Ya Bari Ta'ala, what shall I say? He is communing with Allah. Nobody hears him. He is pressing, so to say, his spiritual buttons, trying to contact the head computer, from the preserved tablet, the knowledge is coming. He is pressing his spiritual buttons, no buttons there. There are no buttons there, but figuratively, figuratively, so to say, he is pressing his spiritual buttons. Siya baritala, what shall I say? Comes the answer. Qul, huwallahu ahad, say, he is Allah the one and only. Allah Samad, God the Eternal Absolute, Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad, He begets not, nor is He begotten, wa Lam Yakun Lahu Kufuan Ahad, and there's nothing like unto Him. Now, once I repeat that, I said, What did I say? Ask people, What did I say? He said, Well, you said that there's only one Allah, one God, I said, yeah. What else? So, well, there's got no father, no son, I said, yeah. What else? Because it's difficult. Because it's all concentrated stuff. It is so concentrated. And the message is so... It, it, it's so much per, 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 pervasive. It is. So much is involved in these four short verses. It's like an ocean of theology, the knowledge of God. An ocean. This th four verses. But in its concentrated form, you just read the meaning and you pass over onto something else. You lost everything. You need a commentary and this one gives it to you. Explain to you that what is one and only, when it says he does not be getting, not be cotton, to whom it is being addressed. But coming back to the surah itself, ikhlas, surah ikhlas, which is a surah of purity. We are told, and I believe, that if you read surah ikhlas, we say kul huwallah three times, you get the sawab of reading the whole Qur'an. Have you heard that before? Yes. We say when we start, say Dua Fatiha. So everybody starts with Surah Fatiha, Alhamdulillah. And then we read Surah Kulhu Allah three times, the Surah Ikhlas three times. And we believe that Allah will give us the blessings as if we read the whole Qur'an. It's a quite an amazing thing. This Qur'an an encyclopedia. You read twelve lines, that's four times three. 12 lines, 12 verses, 12 ayahs, and you get the value of the whole Qur'an in blessings. Doesn't it make you want to think, what is there in it? Just four verses, three times, four threes are 12, and I get the blessings of the whole Qur'an. Why should it be so? What makes it so valuable, invaluable? It's, it's worth thinking. You see the reason. I mean, I've been thinking, I've been thinking. I haven't had the chance of asking learned men. I'm not a learned man. People, you know, make, out, make me out to be a great scholar and all that. Actually, I'm a furniture salesman. I've been talking, talking, and I talk myself into talking. Therefore, I come and stand here before you. But I have not had the good fortune of going into a university, secular or religious. The only time I go into a university now is go and talk to them. I haven't had the chance of going and getting any benefit from them from beforehand. So, just thinking about it, what makes it so valuable, invaluable? So I find 
that this surah, these four verses are the touchstone of theology. Means a testing stone of theology. Theology means the knowledge of God. Is the touchstone. If you have this touchstone, you will never go wrong. Any concept of God, any community, any religious group comes along to you and gives you a concept of God. With these four verses as a touchstone, you can either accept or reject. There is no theology on earth that can confound you if you have these four verses in front of you, if you understand its meaning. The person comes along and he says, God is two. Like in Zoroastrianism, there is a God of good and there is a God of evil. He says, Pull, tell them, who Allahu Ad, He is the one and only God that there is. He is not two. The Christians say He is in a trinity, three in one. He says, No, Pull, say, He who Allahu Ahad, He is the one and only. They think there are millions of God like our Hindu cousins. He says, No, say, He is the one and only God that there is. Negatives, all ideas of a plurality, two, three, or many. Out, out, out. Touchstone. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. That he does not beget and is not begotten. The Christians say that Jesus is the only begotten son of God. They say, no, lam yalid wa lam yulad. Negative is the idea. Any theology comes along, this is a touchstone. And they say, God is like this, God is like that, he's so handsome, he's like old Father Christmas, Santa Claus, sitting on some planet with his feet dangling onto the earth as his footstool, the heaven as his canopy, the loving Father in heaven. There's nothing like unto him that can be imagined. So anything you think or imagine is not him. Finish. This is the touchstone. See the touchstone the jeweler uses. You ladies are familiar with jewelers. You go along, let's say your grandmother left some old jewelry, and you take it to be 24 karat gold. And you want to have it remelted and into some modern design. So you go along and say, now what is this worth? My grandma's, you know, take heavy necklace. So the guy, the jeweler, he rubs a part of that jewelry onto his touchstone, his black granite, smooth black granite. He rubs on it and he has samples of other gold. 9 carat, 12 carat, 18 carat, 22 carat, 24 carat gold. That's how they value gold how much pure it is. So, he says, this coloring that on that black stone of your gold, how much yellow or goldish it is, he guesses that this is about nine carat. So he has a nine carat piece. So he rubs on it next to it. He says, well, this is the same as that. So he tells you, Ben, this is nine carat gold. Kachara he kachara. So he says, no, my grandma, she couldn't have kept this and got this as her wedding present, you know, nine carat gold. So you go to another jeweler. Try it sometimes. Go to another jeweler. He said, look, this is pure gold, 24 carat. 22 carat. They need to put two, two carat extra something to make it a little harder, otherwise gold is very soft, it will bend very quickly. So this is 22 carat. He says, bring it here, sister. He rubs on his touchstone and he rubs, he says, mm, this one here is nine carat. It seems like a collusion going on between all the jewelers. You know, one follower rings up all the other jewelers and says, look, there's a woman coming along, you know, in black burqa and you know, you must tell her it's nine. You must, everybody must. No, you know it's not so. He's got a touchstone. And from that touchstone, he knows, nine carat. You go to a hundred different jewelers, they tell you nine carat, nine carat, nine carat, nine carat. It's not twenty-two as you are imagining. So, this is the touchstone. This Surah Ikhlas is the touchstone. Whereby, therefore, Allah says, puts this value upon it. He says, look, you read it four times, three times. In other words, you understand what you are reading. Not just a rattling of three times, the Surah. Three times you read the surah. That's how long does it take? Not even two minutes. Not the rattling it off gives you that value. In other words, you have now imbibed that standard. You have got the touchstone 
of testing the knowledge of God. Whatever the guy tells you, you know to what degree of acceptability it has. Touchstone. How many carat gold it is. Touchstone. So you see, it's a very concentrated book. We need a tafsir. So this particular one gives you that. It gives you the tafsir commentary. Then this one has a very comprehensive index. Just like a dictionary. Right at the back, our sister said, this is from Surah Nisa. If you remember Nisa, Nisa means women in your honor. Allah Bari Tala has revealed a chapter in his book in your honor. Surah Nisa. Chapter Nisa means women. So she said, Nisa, where are you going to find Surah Nisa in this volume? Very easy. And the N, like a dictionary, N, look for Nisa. N-I-S-A, Nisa. Oh, it tells you Nisa, chapter 4. So, chapter 4 is easy to find, because every page is numbered, chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 114. So, 4 is easy to find. So, verse number 171. Once you found chapter 4, 171 is easy to find. I had to find it there. While I was sitting there, I gave me an idea. I said, now what shall I do? I said, mashallah, very good. As if Allah has inspired my sister to say, look, talk about this. You see? So make my task easy. Instead of thinking, things, they were asking me, what are you going to talk about? What? I said, look, man, I don't know. I don't know. And I was planning, planning something. But as if this was an answer to my prayer, talk about this. I said, let me talk about that. So the verse our sister began with was, there's no collusion between me and her. I don't even, if, I won't be able to recognize her in the audience. Wallah, I can guarantee you that. That if I see like this, if she comes again on the stage, I'll recognize her. But in the audience, it'll be difficult for me to go and pick her up. To say, who read it here? I don't know. So she began, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Waqalu, Qul, Astaghfirullah. Qul. She started with Qul. Say, oh, let me finish the first Qul. About Qul Huwalla. You see, there, when he was, our Nabi was questioned, Oh Muhammad, what is your concept of God? So I said, he pressed, so to say, his spiritual buttons. I hope you, my sisters, understand. I don't care for my brothers whether they understand or not what I'm talking about. As long as you understand it right. There were no buttons. I lost two buttons in two days. Wallah, yesterday I lost one, I was just trying to put it in and it went. This afternoon, I tried to do the same and it went. And now I don't want to take a chance with the third one. <laughs> These buttons, you see, they get lost. My brother promised me that when we go to the hotel, he'll sew it on for me. So, so he is pressing, trying to commune with Allah Bari Tala. Ya Bari Tala, what shall I say? comes the answer, Qul, say, Huwallahu Ahad, he is Allah the one and only. If you asked him, he said, why do you say, say, he is God the one and only? Look, if you are questioned about anything, somebody asks you, what is six times six? If you have gone to school and learned your arithmetic, your, your ta multiplication tables, you say six times six, you say 36. What is 12 times 12? It's 144. You don't say, say 144. You don't say, say 36. Do you? No, because you have the answer. What is 2 times 2? What do you say? 4. You don't say, say 4. Do you? No, you don't say, say 4. You say, 4. Why is this man saying, say he is God the one and only? Because, because he is not talking. He is not talking. The words you are hearing are from his lips. They are coming out of his mouth. But they are not his words. He is asking. He is communing. Ya Bari Tala, what shall I say? Comes the answer through him. Say, he is Allah the one and only. So he says, say, he is Allah the one and only. Now you see, these are not his words. It goes to prove also that this is the wahi, it's a revelation. When you read that chapter, four verses. There is no explanation there in the Quran itself. 
the tafsir is my, the mufassir is not able to explain what happened and what not, what I'm telling you now. But there is nothing there in the Quranic text to tell you what was going on. That Muhammad Sallallahu was in Medina and the Christian deputation had come from Najran and the Prophet housed them in the Masjid and Nabawi and you know he fed them and he looked after them and they had a discussion for three days and three nights. Nothing. And while the discussion was going on, the spokesman for the Christian poses the question and Muhammad, you know, he pressed his spiritual buttons and he got the answer and this is what he said. Hmm? It's not all there. Nothing is there. Allah starts. Kul, who Allah who ahad, Allah who samad, lam yalid, walam yulad, walam yakun lahu kufon ahad. And then back again to normal. He says, You see, now this is our concept of God on a different level. It's all Arabic, but this Arabic is something different. Like a machine gun fire. Tak, 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 tak. Kul, who Allah who ahad, Allah who samad, lam yalid, walam yulad, walam yakun lahu kufon. And you see, this is our concept of God. This is, I wanted to share that with you. That this is how the Quran came to him in word form. What he received, it made indelible impression on his heart and mind. Uh, and he had this thing scribed by the scribes, write it down because he was an ummi. He was unlearned, unlettered, and it was preserved on palm leaf fiber, shoulder blades of animals, on skins, and kept in a chest, and in the hearts and minds of men, memorized. This is how originally the Quran was preserved for us. And this is the Quran that Muhammad sallallahu he left for us. So coming back to the subject. Qul. Again, say. Our Nabi is commanded to say. Tell them. Who? Ya Ahlul Kitab. O people of the book. Who are the people of the book? Is it the Jews and the Christians? They are the people of the book. Meaning, they had a scripture. They had certain written books. And they claimed that they were a learned people, as against the Arabs. The Arabs were an ummi people, an unlettered people. And an ummi prophet was sent to them. Amazing. An ummi prophet, one who can't read and write, comes to an ummi people who can't read and write. And yet this is given a book that puts to shame the wisdom of the learner. I mean, it's a miracle to show you that this is not his work. This is the work of, this is Allah's kalam. He couldn't have done it. Muhammad couldn't have, no man could have done a job like this. Purely on a physical level, material level. You see, this is an encyclopedia. The Quran is an encyclopedia of 114 surahs. Given by Allah bari ta'ala, to his prophet, the holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We say this is a revelation, a wahi. The outsider, the enemy says, no, this is Muhammad's work. Muhammad wrote this book. But he said, look, he was an ummi. He couldn't read or write. They say, well, maybe. But wasn't he a great orator? Wasn't he a great thinker? Could he not have rehashed what he heard in his environment? from the people about the Jews and their Christians and about Jesus and about Abraham and Moses and about Yusuf salam. Could he not, what the stories he heard, rehash it in a beautiful language? As a great thinker, as a great orator, couldn't he have done it? Well, he could have. So, so you see, knowing full well, we know that this is not his work. Allah Bari Ta'ala testifies to it in the Holy Quran. He says, وَمَا يَنْتِكُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ he does not speak from his own desire. In huwa illa wahnu yuha. It is no less than an inspiration sent down to him. Allamahu shadidul kuwa. He is taught by one mighty in power. It's not his. But the enemy says this is his handiwork. It's right. For a moment, I tell you, agree with him. Agree with him for a moment. For a moment. Knowing full well that this is not his work. This is not the work of man. I so, said, all right, I agree with you that Muhammad wrote the book. In that case, this is a one-man job. He's got to agree. In that case, it's a one-man job. He doesn't say that Omar, Abu Bakr, and Usman, and Ali, and Muhammad, they all sat together and they, re they wrote this and rehashed it and they planned it. No, no, no. So this is one-man job. It's not his job, but since the enemy says it is his, it's right. This is his work, his handiwork. It's a one-man job. You agree? And they must agree, it's a one-man job. 
I said, let's have a look at your book. See, I forgot to put it in my bag. I would have shown it to you. The Bible. I said, you see, this is your book, the Bible. It has 73 books. That of the Roman Catholics, the Bible has 73 books inside. You know, those booklets put together to make an encyclopedia called the Bible. The, Ro the Protestant world have 66 books. I mean 66 little booklets, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and on and on, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 66. I said those 66 books were written by 40 different authors. Right? He says right. 40 different guys went to make this one book. This is one man's job. Purely on its physical level, just the material aspect of it. This one man puts into shade your 40 authors. The greatest writer among your 40 authors is Paul. Paul, Saint Paul. I said he wrote 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament. More than half. 14 out of 27 books were written by one man, Paul. And all the Paul's books put together is not this. It's not this amount. Not even this amount. Not even quarter inch. Thick. Says, so come on, tell me now. Tell me now. Let's say on the very value that you're putting it in. One man job against 40. I said, this one man puts into shade all your 40 different authors. And he's not just filling up any kind of rubbish stories, fairy tales. He's giving you the elixir of life, guidance for this world and in the hereafter. Everything pertinent for your needs. You read the other thing, so many things, we have no time to go into it. So, the address is Ya Ahlal Kitab. Oh, people of the book, look, they got 66 books. They say this is all from God. It's right. You are a learned people. That's how Allah talks to them. He humors them. You are a learned people. How can you go off like that? How can you say this? How? As a learned people, Paul now says, Ya Ahlal Kitab, oh, people of the book. La taghlu fi dinikum. He says, do not go to extremes in your religion. Don't go to extremes in your religion. Look, we are not made to say, oh, leave us alone. We are Muslims. We are good people. We pray five times a day and we don't drink and we don't gamble and we don't dance. You know, we are very charitable people. Leave us alone. No, no, this is not Islam. You do all these things, mashallah. But there's something more than that is required from us. People who are going wrong, going off the track. Uttering blasphemies, blasphemies, kufr against the prophets of God, against Allah. It is our duty to rectify them, call them to the right path. So Allah commands us to tell them, Ya Ahlul Kitab, O Jews and Christians, there, here it refers to Jews and Christians, La Taghlu Fi Dinikum, do not go to extremes in your religion. Aren't you interfering with them? Yes. Why don't you mind your own business? So no, this is our business. Allah has made us the torchbearers of light and learning to the world. He has appointed us as the Kuntum Khaira Ummatin Ukhrijat Linas, that you are the best of people evolved for mankind. For mankind. What makes us the best of people? Because we say we are Sayyids and Afghans and Pathans and what and what not. No. You are an Arab. You are a Nigerian. What, what makes you the best of people? He gives you. The qualification, the standard that makes us the best of people is the ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna anil munkar because you enjoin what is right and you forbid what is wrong. Wa tu'minuna billah and you believe in Allah. If these are your qualifications, then you are the best of people. Then if you are the best of people, that honor, that privilege imposes upon us certain responsibilities. And among the responsibilities is that we should share this honor with other people. And the fittest people to receive this sharing are the Jews and the Christians because they were already prepared to receive the message. Prophets after prophets were sent to them. I won't go into that aspect. Allah says in that verse, But if the people of the book, meaning the Jews and the Christians, if they hearken to this message, it will be better for them. In other words, it will be better for you. Muslims will be better for you if they listen to this message. Minhumul mu'minuna, among them there are mu'mins, good people, faithful people, sincere people. Among them, among the Jews, there are good people. Among the Christians, there are good people. Allah says, Wa But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. 
two types of people. Good people and the guy who is rebellious wanting to put up a fight with you. Want to steal your children, calling you names, want to send you to hell. Abusing the Prophet, abusing the Quran, abusing Islam. How to approach them both? You can't discount anyone. The good man, how to approach him. And the devilish fellow, how to tackle him. But our subject, going back to our subject. La taghlu fi dinikum. He said, do not go to extremes in your religion. The Jews and the Christians were going to extremes with regards to the personality of Jesus Christ, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. So, وَلَا تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْحَقِّ And don't say anything about Allah except the truth. إِنَّمَا الْمَسِيحِ Most certainly the Messiah, Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary, Rasulullah, is the messenger of Allah. وَكَلِمَتُهُ And a word proceeding from him. أَلْقَاهَا إِلَى مَرْيَمُ وَرُوهُمْ مِنْهُمْ Which he bestowed upon Mary and a spirit proceeding from him. فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرُسُلِهِ So believe in Allah and His Messenger. 